Free will is the, is the contra-causal ability to refrain or not refrain from a given moral action. You're going to actually hear John Lennox here explain his perspective. And a lot of the older... Uh, generation of, of apologists, they've kind of taken that road on that particular issue. Just kind of, let's just not get into that. John Lennox is in the same kind of camp. He doesn't come right out and say Calvinism or you know, Arminianism. He doesn't use those vernacular, but his interpretations and his words very clearly align with the free will um, view of God's creation, uh, an affirmation of, of choice uh, in the way that we would define it. And when you listen to his words, it becomes very evident that he does not hold to the same views of men like John Piper, for example, who very clearly deny the, con the concept of self-determination or the ability of free will as, as typically defined by philosophers like John Lennox. And so with that in mind, keep in mind, he's not going to get specific and talk about specifically Calvinism, but he's going to very clearly defend the doctrine of free will as we would understand it. And he's going to give some really great explanations, in my estimation, of how to deal with these tough issues from uh, the perspective of, of an apologist dealing also with uh, atheists, as well as how to just answer very tough philosophical questions. Let's tune in and listen. Talk to me about a God who created the atom. That's right. Who upholds the universe. Who invented light. Who painted every color. Who invented the human mind. Why couldn't he then have made a universe that didn't get itself into such a mess? Couldn't God have made beings that didn't sin, that didn't destroy each other? My answer may shock you. Of course he could. <coughs> of course he could. We make them, you know, in laboratories. We call them robots. Of course you can make beings that are non-moral. But now I have a wife, and I've been married to the same one for 44 years, which isn't bad, is it? <laughs> now you imagine if I had a robotic wife, a very sophisticated one with the, with the proper screen and, you know, all the kind of sophisticated iPad technology. So I go back from Rice University and my wife comes to the door. There's the screen all glowing and I see a word marked kiss. So I go, kiss. And I get a beautiful robotic kiss. <laughs> well, why are you laughing? But you say, would that be a real kiss? Well, they're making robots that are very similar to human beings these days. But you know that it wouldn't be real because there's no choice in the matter. She's programmed to do what she does. Now, let me explain it carefully. Of course God could make a universe with creatures in it that, in that sense, cannot sin. There are loads of them, animals. When the lion eats your head off at the zoo because you put it between the bars, we don't put him in the high court. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I think C.S. Lewis helped me a great deal here. I don't think it's the final answer, but it's a way in to see that in order to make beings that have the capacity to love, they must have the capacity to hate. If you're going to have the capacity to say yes, you must have the capacity to say no. And you say, well, why did God do that? Why do you have children? Never forget holding my first child in my arms and realizing that I have brought this little girl into the world. She could grow up to say no to me. Why take the risk? Do you ever think about it? Why do we do it, ladies and gentlemen? Because we realize that granted the risk, the benefits outweigh the risk. 
To live in a world where love is possible. We all crave for a world in which love is actualized. And you hope one day, maybe you've already got there, you students at Rice, that you'll meet somebody and fall in love with them and they'll fall in love with you and they'll value you and they'll choose you. And the value of that, and you know that it's got an inherent risk. God took a risk to make a universe with people in it, made in his image, capable of choosing capable of saying yes to God and equally capable of saying no, moral beings. One of the big questions that rises is justice. Now, Dawkins says there is no justice. And if atheism is true, ladies and gentlemen, the vast majority of people will never get justice. And if there is no life after this life, there's no life to get justice in. So they will never get justice. And yet our human hearts, they cry out for justice. They sense that we live in a moral universe, that there must be something somewhere. Otherwise, our notion of justice is a sheer illusion, and it mocks us. What can atheism say in the context of massive injustice? Hitler murders six million Jews and then he takes a gun and he blows his head off and he's got away with it because he will never have to face any ultimate question of responsibility. Is that true? I think there's something in every human being that says that cannot be true. Now, of course, a feeling in our hearts that something cannot be true doesn't mean it isn't true. But as C.S. Lewis pointed out, it would be very strange. If in a world where we find ourselves with an appetite for food, there was no food. In a world where we find an appetite for sex, there was no sex. In a world where we find we have an appetite for friendship and justice and morality, there was none. He said it would be a very strange world. And Richard Dawkins said to me once, yes, the picture I paint is bleak, but that doesn't mean it's false. I said, Richard, it doesn't mean it's true either. <laughs> there's another question we can ask, and that is this. Granted that there's a risk, did God make any provision if things went wrong? I love that question. You see, even free will points us to Christ, the provision. This is one of the reasons that uh, if you don't like the term traditionalism, I love the term provisionalism. Uh, and it, you don't have to limit it to Southern Baptist traditionalists. You can call yourself a provisionalist. In other words, I believe that God provides all that is needed for every man, woman, boy, and girl for them to experience life uh, everlasting, that, that God ha provides all all that we need. That I, I love the term provisionalist. Um, if, if I could rename traditionalist to provisionalist, so that people couldn't come around saying, "Hey, well, we're, uh, this SBC was started by Calvinist," or you know, and get into all that debate, who cares? Call us provisionalist. All right, I, I would be glad to take on that name. It's a great term to describe our our view because God, in His graciousness, not by, by, because He's obligated to, because He's a loving God and chooses to, He provides the means by which everyone may be saved. Um, and, and, I, and I love his explanations in there um, on the doctrine of free will, the, referring to C.S. Lewis and the, what real love and relationship looks like. You ask any kid, do you want this real puppy or do you want this um, fake puppy that looks just, they look exactly alike. This one's fake. This one's not real. This one's just a stuffed animal, but it's not going to poop on your, your, your carpet. It's not going to chew up your favorite toys. Um, it's not going to ever do anything you don't want it to do. It'll do exactly what you want it to do. And do you want this fake puppy? It'll, it'll only move when you want it to move. It'll only do what you want it to do. Or do you want this real puppy over here that's trying to get away? <laughs> Which one do you want? Every kid's going to choose the real puppy. Why? Why? Because it's love worth having. That's why. That's why we believe in free will. That's why we believe that people can make their own determinations as to who they worship and serve. And this concept and idea that God irresistibly or effectually changes you to make you want him... Um, and makes kind of this 
really a, a world of automaton that um, C.S. Lewis uses it as whenever you take it, it to that that far of a view to understand that we are um, truly responsible people. Don't let Calvinists redefine free will to mean something it does not mean. Free will is the is the contra-causal ability to refrain or not refrain from a given moral action. It's the ability to make a real choice. Look up the word choice in Webster's. That's free will. The, the ability to choose between um, among available options. It's not being controlled by your greatest preset desire. That's called animal instinct. Lions <laughs> have animal instinct. Okay, animals choose according to instinct. They ref, they 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 have reflexive desires. They don't they don't deliberate. They don't reason. They don't they don't choose. We do. We we have many competing desires, and we choose which of those desires we're going to act to fulfill. This concept, this circular argument that we will always choose according to our greatest preset desire. And how do you know what your greatest preset desire is? Well, because that's the one you choose. And how do you, why did you choose it? Because it's your greatest. It's a circular argument. It's, it's, it's nonsensical. It means absolutely nothing to say that we choose according to our greatest preset desire because the only way you know what your greatest preset desire is because you chose it. And you're just assuming by begging the question that it wasn't your choice to act upon that desire versus some other one you could have acted upon. And that's what separates us from the animals. We are moral beings because we have the power of self-determination. This is a part of the Imago Dei. We were created in the image of God to be able to make real choices, to choose which of the desires that are competing within us to act upon. And that's our responsibility. That's why we're held responsible for our choices. I want to play one last video in closing from John Lennox, who's asked a question about uh, apologetics and about the free will of man and the sovereignty of God and how to deal with that even from the atheist who asked that question. Tune in and listen to this. You touched on this a little bit this morning, but it's about God's sovereignty versus humans' free will. Yes. And I'm in a dialogue with an atheist, and uh, he, he's a brilliant guy, really is, and I have my own ways of responding to him, but I want to know what you would say if... He says that how can God be sovereign over everything if he's an all-powerful God and also not have given us a deterministic, how does God give us free will and not ha not be all-powerful? And also if God knew that humanity was going to screw up, we were going to sin, then how is it fair for God, knowing that was going to happen, to punish humanity for its sins? So again, I, I have responded in some ways to him, and I think it's pretty comprehensive. I just wanted to hear what you I think it's that. pretty comprehensive. How many hours have you got? <laughs> <laughs> now that is an immensely important question, and it's in a sense one that we'll be dealing with gradually as we go through. But I'm very glad you posed it from the perspective of atheism. I want to say one basic thing about it, first of all, because I'll go more into detail, and that is this. The way you phrased it is the way it's normally phrased. How could God be sovereign over history and give you free will? Well, when people ask me that question, I ask them, what is consciousness? And of course they tell me they don't know. They don't even know, our physicist friends, what energy is. Those are much simpler things than the question you have asked me. You asked me the question, how? Now, the how of these deep things, there are many of them we just cannot answer. How did God speak the universe into existence? I don't know. But that he spoke it into existence, I do believe there's evidence for it. So I distinguish between the how and the that. And the importance of that is this, that you can see the evidence within Scripture and within experience as well, that that is the most sensible way to understand the universe. In other words, I take Scripture seriously. And when Scripture tells me that God rules, his kingdom is, was, and ever shall be. I believe that. 
When I hear the Son of God stand on earth and say to Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you under my wings and you wouldn't, I believe that too. That we have a real capacity to say either yes or no to God. How that works, I don't know. Let me illustrate that for you, because you might just find this useful. And stop me if I've said this yesterday, but I don't think I did. I did say it recently somewhere. Um, I'm getting old. You You have to forgive me. But... I was asked at a big uh, lecture I gave to about 500 physicists, very senior physicists in England. A man came up to me afterwards and said, you know, that was a very interesting talk on science and religion, but I perceive that you are a Christian. I said, you're very sharp. (laughs) And he said, but look, he said, you know, as a Christian, you're obliged to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I said, that's right. He said, explain to me how that can be. And I said, well, very easily. But as a quid pro quo, I'll ask you a question. And so I asked him what consciousness was. And he said he didn't know. And then I asked him what energy was. And he says, well, we can measure it and use it. I said, that wasn't my question. What is it? He said, I don't know. So I said, that's interesting. But you believe in both consciousness and energy, don't you? And you don't know what they are. Should I write you off as a physicist? (laughs) And he said, please don't. But I said, you were going to write me off five minutes ago. Because I couldn't explain to you how Jesus could be God and man at the same time. But you observe that I believe it quite correctly. Tell me, I said, why do you believe in consciousness and energy? Well, that was a bit too philosophical for him. So I had to help him because I'm a kind person at heart. (laughs) And I said, you believe them, not because you understand them fully, but because of their explanatory power. He said, that's right. And I said, that's exactly why I believe that Jesus is both God and man. Not because I understand how. If we don't understand the nature of energy, how could we possibly understand the nature of God? But I believe it because there's evidence that it's true. Just as I believe that light is both waves and particles, however difficult I find that to get together. And you can see the relevance to your question. It's one of those questions where people, because they can't integrate it intellectually, tend to push to one side or the other. It seems to me that scripture teaches both things. And that these stories that we're looking at are an unpacking of how it works so that we can see how it relates to our lives.